Okay, so for this last brief part, we're going to discuss the case study um, by Leatherman and Thomas from the text, from the Hanan Horn text, which is focusing on the issue of armed conflict in Peru as a case example of the, the CMA, the Critical Medical Anthropology Approach in Medical Anthropology. Um, and so a few points that they emphasized there that I just wanted to highlight and encourage you to, of course, read the assigned text so you are aware of all of those points. But um, they make several in, in opening that only recently, for example, have the health aspects of armed conflict been highlighted or really studied um, in the way that we would imagine. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, they talk about the challenges of studying the health effects of war, which one of them, which uh, is kind of, kind of commonsensical, but it's just the issue of access, secure access to populations that are most affected by war are also, of course, extremely constraining for us to do any kind of data collection or research um, that would require us to be on the ground in those most challenging of circumstances. So they argue for greater attention to post-conflict conditions from the perspective of those who are most vulnerable on the ground. Um, so they're actually, uh, I think, giving a call to anthropologists to fill the gap here to some degree, since some of the techniques that anthropologists use, like ethnography and participant observation, are actually quite amenable to studying these kinds of conditions. Um, and there are anthropologists doing that kind of work around the world including these authors. Um, so they distinguish between structural violence and political violence um, at one point, and they're defining um, political violence as that we would more often consider to, to be, to, to do with the government. So, you know, the government and laws and legal aspects of society versus structural violence, which includes a whole set of political and economic relationships at a global scale um, that enact or create or enable um, conditions of violence. This is this idea of structural violence that we just discussed. Um, <clears throat> so they use this uh, kind of framing, this sort of approach to look at the civil war in Peru and to understand the relationship between political conflict and health um, over a period of time. So they emphasize the enormous health costs of war and conflict in terms of morbidity and mortality at a global scale. And they, they provide this measure of approximately 15 million deaths globally in 1999 alone due to conflict and its aftermath. So 15 million people dying. Um, and of course, that doesn't even address, that's just mortality, that doesn't address, I'm sorry, that's morbidity and mortality. So yes, so 15 million in terms of mor morbidity, illness, and death. Um, <clears throat> they make the point that many people die away from home as refugees, so even counting who is most affected by war in terms of health outcomes is challenging because people often uh, uh, experience those effects outside of their native land. Um, so trauma is also something they say is understudied. Um, we don't really know to what degree the people that have experienced conditions of conflict and war suffer long-term from diagnoses such as PTSD, um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and they talk about in this article, the problems in actually being able to do that kind of work to see to what degree is PTSD something that is commonly experienced in conflict or post-conflict um, around the world, in part because those scales to measure PTSD are also culturally biased. They're, um, they're more oriented toward the West, and they're scales that have been developed primarily in English to measure different criteria um, that are diagnostic of PTSD. And then they also ask this question of to what degree trauma um, varies from place to place, in part due to how violence can become routinized in certain contexts. So in certain places like where he's talking about where there's been civil war for a very long period of time and people have grown up and been socialized in contexts of violence, to what degree does that make people more desensitized to in a certain way and perhaps as a coping mechanism um, 
to issues of, uh, of violence so that their trauma is expressed differently. Their trauma might not be express, expressed the same way that we would imagine it would be um, expressed perhaps in our cultural context. Um, so these are some complexities that they're referring to in the measurement uh, of doing this kind of work. They talk about different kinds of uh, factors that actually affect uh, the relationship between war and health outcomes. So one of those is that it's very common in scenarios of war for food systems to be damaged or destroyed entirely, leading to starvation. So this and this actually can become a strategy of war in which uh, enemy sides um, actually are involved in destroying food resources of the of the enemy as a strategy of war. Um, they also talk about how the cost of war affects budgets for health, which is something that people don't often think about. But the fact that we spend so much more, um, in general societies spend so much more on war than they spend on health, that if they weren't spending so much on war, they ask the question, um, would we be able to more effectively deal with some of the, the most serious global health problems? Um, and of course, they're falling on the side of yes, they, they would. but. They make the comparison of three weeks of world arms spending is equal to the World Health Organization's annual budget. So the annual budget for the entire World Health Organization, which, which works all over the globe, um, uh, is only equivalent to three work weeks of world arms spending. So then they also make the point that structural adjustments are strongly linked to armed conflict. So in other words, where conflict occurs is not random. It also tends to go um, follow consistently in line with economic policies that endanger the poor in particular and that contribute to inequalities in income. Um, and so structural adjustments are uh, one of the strategies that the global north has used to um, essentially neo-colonize the global south. And so they're referring to that um, that set of mechanisms of economic structural adjustments that are also very strongly linked to armed conflicts when you look at them globally. So um, they then summarize more about their specific case and I, for the sake of time, I'm gonna go quickly through this, but encourage you to read the findings in the chapter on the specific ethnographic cases but he's discussing a period of time that began in the 1970s um, and then he traces them all the way through to the early 1990s um, and it involves a chronic situation of civil war in which uh, agrarian communities were essentially, uh, their policies were being used to encourage large-scale sharecropping and there was, um, uh, you know, land reform uh, conflicts. Uh, the government was trying to reform land in order to take over large tracts of land and the local communities that were the victims of that in the Andes protested and there were then groups like the Sendero Luminoso which came to emerge in, in Peru and in rural Peru and contributed to uh, both sides, contributed to all sides because there's multiple complexities here that they describe but contributed to situations that greatly affected food security and trauma in rural Peru. Um, they described then their period of time of ethnographic field work in one community in particular, and they did a kind of pre and post ethnography where they followed people, this community longitudinally in Peru to see what the effects were um, on the local community in terms of the, their health. Um, and they talk about trauma in particular um, as something that they see uh, persisting over time in this community, but they also invite us to think about how it's distinct, um, how trauma might not be expressed in precisely the same way in rural Peru as uh, it would be expressed in the U.S. Um, <clears throat> so in sum, they are arguing for greater ethnographic research on pre- and post-conflict conditions. They really want us to have more research in the field with communities from the perspective of communities of conflict and war and its effects, both short term and long term. Um, and they advocate we take a broad view of health and well-being to understand the impact of conflict on social solidarity. Um, they're talking in this piece in particular about how uh, 
social solidarity and the community suffered by the by nature of the the kind of war that it was, in which you have neighbors that is that are potentially your enemies, but you don't necessarily know who they are. So there was chronic suspicion that contributed to a particular kind of health impact um, in this in this context. And they also suggest that there's no consistent relationship between conflict and long-term trauma or resilience, and that we need much more longitudinal research of this kind to be able to answer that kind of question about the long-term effects um, on these communities. So I, we will leave it there, and I look forward to following up with you on these readings and the new readings when I return. <laughs>